through years of consulting, I realized that two people with the same job, with the same boss, with the same to-do list can have wildly different experiences at work. One person is thriving, they're showing up with energy, they have motivation, they're getting these opportunities, and the other person thinks their job sucks. And it's the same job, it's the same sales rep position, it's the same project manager position. So what drove me to write Leading Yourself is what is causing them to have different experiences. Elizabeth Letardo is a consultant, writer, and online instructor who helps organizations drive emotional engagement. Her new book, Leading Yourself, has been called a refreshingly candid playbook that helps you create a work experience worth loving right now. With an undergraduate degree in advertising from Boston University and a master's in industrial and organizational psychology, Elizabeth works with senior leaders from frontline managers to entry-level teammates to create more purpose-driven work experiences. Her clients include Salesforce, DraftKings, Hilton, and numerous Berkshire Hathaway organizations. She is also a popular LinkedIn learning instructor who designs workshops on topics like leading without formal authority, finding your purpose at work, and leading yourself. Elizabeth writes for Harvard Business Review, and her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal and on NPR, and now she's sharing her expertise with the Prospecting on Purpose audience. Elizabeth, I'm so excited to have you. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sarah. I'm so excited to be here and be with your listeners. Well, I loved the book. I can't wait to get into it. And the reason why I really loved it is because there were so many takeaways that were immediately implementable for just the average person. I feel like so many business books are geared at the C-suite and it's not as digestible or relatable or actionable. So that's, I just wanted to like give you big kudos right at the top here because I had so many great takeaways from it. Well, I'm so glad to hear that you that you resonated with it. And the reason I wrote the book for the average person is because I spent my entire career and am still an average person, right? The vast majority of business books and sales books are written for 1% of people, the CRO, the CEO, the CFO. And I wanted to write something that put the power back in the hands of the frontline teammate. Awesome. And so that gives us like a little sneak peek into the motivation, but give us a little bit more about like the origin story. How'd you come up with um, the idea to create a content and a book around this? Well, I work in consulting and my business partner is Lisa McLeod, who's been on your show. And through years of consulting, I realized that two people with the same job, with the same boss, with the same to-do list, can have wildly different experiences at work. One person is thriving, they're showing up with energy, they have motivation, they're getting these opportunities, and the other person thinks their job sucks. And it's the same job, it's the same sales rep position, it's the same project manager position. So what drove me to write Leading Yourself is, what is causing them to have different experiences and how can, from whatever seat you're in, can you apply the mindsets, the skills, the beliefs, the behaviors to get yourself to that better experience? How can you, even inside of an imperfect job, working for an imperfect leader, make something that works for you? It's almost like, like the Pepsi challenge. Like, why is this person performing so well? And where do you think, like in all your research and, and background, where do you think disgruntled work experiences or workers, where does it stem from? The vast majority of disgruntled work experiences stem from unmet expectations, right? Our organization is not doing, behaving, believing how we think they should. Our leader is not doing, behaving, believing how we think they should. And our job is not the way we think it should be. And because these things, our organization, our leader, our role, aren't meeting our expectations, we're often left feeling disappointed and resentful. And that becomes a self-fulfilling cycle. Mm, unmet expectations. That's such a great like umbrella for any type of circumstance too. Yeah, because- it applies to your marriage too. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say personal <laughs> That's so funny. Well, and I think that what's interesting about that to me too is I almost feel like there's power in just identifying it too and naming it because once you start to pinpoint, you know, as people are listening, as we go through this, once you identify where it's coming from, then you can start to treat the problem or, you know, treat the, treat the real problem there. And what 
I mean, what would you say if people, so what I loved about the book and I, this is, this show's on YouTube too. So you can watch this episode on YouTube, but I love that it's called leading yourself despite imperfect bosses, weird economies, lethargic coworkers, annoying systems, and too many deliverables. That's what we're all up against. It's so, so hits the nail on the head. And I, I can think of a lot of people close in my life that are in a job that they're not passionate about for one reason or another. And so what would you say to people who are in roles where they're, you know, we need to maybe identify those unmet expectations, but also if there's lack of passion, like what, what would you say to someone who's experiencing a lack of passion in their role? It's okay to not be passionate about your job. It's a great feeling if you are, but what the research tells us is you don't need passion to perform well at work and you don't even need passion to have a deeply meaningful experience. The reason I wanted to call out so many of those frustrating elements directly on the cover is to show people that you are seen. These are things we are all up against. No one has a perfect boss. Everyone has too much to do. Everyone's working with someone, a coworker who might not be their best friend had they not had to share an office with them. Those things are ever present, no matter your industry, no matter your job, over your career, you'll experience all of them. The challenge is to move from a place of emotional resentment and that unmet expectation angst into tactical maneuvering. And how do you address those things from the seat you're in without waving a magic wand? And the answer is to not convince yourself that your job is the best thing in the entire world. The answer is to find small elements of what you can control, small pieces of meaning that taken together can make a transformative impact on your work experience. Awesome. Okay. Let's get into how we can do that. So what, I guess, what does it mean to lead yourself? Let's start there. To lead yourself is to look at any situation as small as one sales call, as big as your entire job and think, What elements of this are in my control and how can I move those levers? And it's often more than you think. And that shift sounds really simple. Shifting from what's going on to what of this can I control? And intellectually, it is simple to understand and it's more challenging to implement it. But when you do implement it, when you shift your mind to focusing on what's in your control, what can you change instead of dwelling on what you can't, everything changes. And that mindset, that skill set shows up in a thousand different ways from your one-on-one to how you set goals to the things you raise your hand for at work. And together, they make that transformative impact. So I'd say it is easy to understand and a harder concept to implement. (laughs) Yeah, it's simple, but not easy. Maybe that's a good way to summarize. And I like the idea of focusing on what you can control and pull the levers from there. Because I think that when I was reading through your book, you had so many examples and like really tactical takeaways that it's like, oh, that is something that's in everyone's control. So can we go through a couple of examples? Like what would be a good example if someone's listening to this? So let's say your manager, I know a lot of your listeners are in sales, hands you an impossible target to hit. Have you ever been there, right? You get this number and you feel this pit in your stomach, like how on earth am I going to do this? And even if I pull it off this year, I know next year is even going to be more insane. That feeling is a powerless feeling, feeling like what if our product goes wrong? What if my customers have unrealistic pricing expectations? What if our competitor does something really threatening? And all of a sudden we're looking at this big number with a pit in our stomach because we don't feel like we can own it. When you shift to what elements go into this number that I I can control, you start focusing on the input instead of the output. How many outbound sales calls can you make? How many prospecting calls can you make a day? What's a target turnaround time for when you follow up with customers? How can you up your skill set? Do you really want to focus on call openings? Do you really want to focus on questions? What are the millions of pieces inside of this big target that was handed to you that you do control, that you 100% own, that don't depend on these outside forces? And when you shift your attention, your energy, your efforts into those elements, we know you drastically increase the likelihood that you will meet that outbound target. You don't guarantee it because lots of things go into it and you feel a lot more energy in the process because instead of holding your breath, hoping that you're going to hit this number, you're focusing your energy on all the behaviors you know that are going to take you there. You know, that's such a great example too, because I feel like there are, I think about a former product that I used to sell and it was by far and away 
the highest in the market compared yeah. to the competitors. And you could see the people that would just find a way to find the value and communicate that versus the people who would just blame how expensive, you know, I'm putting expensive in quotes, yeah. how expensive our product was compared to the competitors. And it was such a night and day conversation. And you could tell that it would irritate senior leadership because it's like, well, other people can sell it. Why can't you, or why can't this region? And so it was, it was an interesting thing to see who and how, cause I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes I'd say, oh, well, Los Angeles is a different market than New York. Yeah. You know, like you find different excuses, but I love that if you pivot it to the inputs and what's in your control, then the outcome is going to change drastically. I think that's a great example. Most of the time. And even if it doesn't change drastically, you're not going to feel the level of defeat that you would had you not been focusing on the input. So let's go back to that. We're both air quoting more expensive example. If the product is truly unreasonably priced and we focused on our inputs, we did all the things we knew would increase the likelihood of meeting that goal and we still don't meet it. We know we did our part. If we spend the whole time complaining that it's too expensive, it's too expensive, it's too expensive, that might be true. But we don't feel particularly good in the process and we don't look particularly good to our boss. So leading yourself is firstly a benefit to you, to your energy, to your mindset, to your motivation at work. It also makes you look really good to the people in charge because you're owning your piece. Right. And then you actually have data and input to say, hey, actually, I think we're overpriced in the market. And here's all my reasons why I tried X, Y, Z. And I think you're right. That positions you as a leader, even if you're in a you know individual contributor role. I think that I'd like you to talk a little bit about maybe the difference between leadership and management too, because that's something that I think when people think leading or leadership, it's a leader of people. And what I I think that's what resonated in the book with me so much is you're a leader at every level, depending on how you operate. So talk a little bit about leadership versus management, and then let's get into more um, specifics here. There's some famous quote that said, people are led and products and numbers are managed, right? And I don't mm. remember who said it or if that's the exact phraseology they used. But to me, the spirit of it rings true. And the book is called Leading Yourself Instead of Managing Yourself because we're going forward, we're focused on some longer range things, these mindsets, behaviors, and beliefs that will span the arc of your career instead of your to-do list today. The book is really practical and can help you with your to-do list today, but it takes a longer view and, and looks at a broader horizon than management does. So it words only mean what they think or what we think they mean. And whether you want to view it as managing yourself, leading yourself, the choice is yours. But the the sentiment of focusing on what's in your control and looking out for you is is ever present. Okay. I love that. And you said something about, you know, the leading yourself and it's a series of mindset, behaviors, and beliefs. Let's talk about that a little bit. Like, what are some of the key traits in those buckets that you see people who lead themselves well? One of the biggest determining factors on whether someone is a successful self-leader or whether they're just throwing their hands up at the scary world around us is, are they able to find purpose in the everyday moments? Mm -hmm. And you know a lot about purpose. Purpose can be this exciting topic that's rich with meaning but it can also feel kind of abstract. Mm. If your company has a purpose statement that's sitting on the website and you're looking at it and you're also looking at your to-do list and you're also looking at your dashboard, it feels disconnected. But the ability to connect what you're doing on a daily basis, the conversations you're having, the action items you're checking off to that bigger purpose or even your own purpose if you're not landing with your company's purpose is a huge determining factor in the motivation that we put forth because we know that when we feel our work counts for something, that it matters, that we're contributing, we put forth more effort and it feels like less. Yeah, it, I feel like it, that focuses the attention away from all of the like baggage and into why am I doing this? Like, why is the baggage worth it? Right. And, and you're not going to find purpose and meaning in every single one of your to do's. You just want to find them occasionally right. because those small glimpses of, hey, this thing really matters is what keeps us going. I love that. And I think that that's something where if you drill down, it's really not that hard to find purpose in your work. Even if it's helping one person or making one one customer's life better or easier in some way, like I think that that's definitely helped shift the mindset. 
The other thing I really liked, you have an example in the book um, around using a training environment. Like there's a group of people and they're in a, you know, company sponsored training event. And I think it really illustrates kind of the two different buckets of people, like those who lead themselves and those who, I don't know what the word terminology, maybe uh, <laughs> probably don't have a fulfilling work experience. We'll say that. Yeah. Are waiting around. Yeah, I want to say victim mentality, but I didn't want to be too harsh because I'm very guilty of it too. So I, we all are. Walk through like that example in the book, if you don't mind, like because I think it shows a really clear like black and white. I'm glad you teased that out because it's so evident in a training environment, the people who are able to lead themselves versus the people who are just sitting around waiting. And I know you have seen this in the sessions you've run to. If you approach a training that you have to go to with the attitude of this is going to suck, I'm not going to get anything out of this. The last one sucked. I can't believe I have to be here. You have just guaranteed it will, in fact, suck. You Mm -hmm. have created that reality. If you go in with an open mind thinking, what can I get out of this? How can I make sure I get something out of this? Let me look for nuggets I could apply. And even if this training isn't perfect, even if 100% of it doesn't land with my role, I'm going to find something that makes this time that I have to spend worth it. That person has a drastically different experience inside the same training room as the person who has already made up their mind that this sucks. And that same dichotomy plays out in how we approach our whole jobs. The person signing on on Monday morning saying, I can't believe I have another week of this nonsense is creating another week of nonsense. And the person signing on Monday morning saying, I'm going to find the opportunity in this. I'm going to make this job my stepping stone. I'm going to lead up in the best ways that I know how. Are they going to have a perfectly joyful work experience? No, of course not. There's still lethargic bosses, annoying coworkers, and all the things in the subtitle. But it's going to be better than the person who is slogging through it. Well, you know, it's funny because I know we're talking about this from like a self-awareness perspective, but when you lay out those two individuals thinking about their coworkers or their colleagues or their managers or their customers. Like, who are you going to want to work with? You're going to want to work with the person who has a positive attitude, who's not bringing the group down because they're grumbling about the training. I think that 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 to me is like where leadership really stems from. And people start to see it from the outer angles too. And you had talked about lethargic bosses. So let's get into um, the imperfect boss concept. Well, I guess, what does an imperfect boss mean? (laughs) A human. We all have them, right? Even the best leader you have ever worked for had an off day, had a rough year at some point, even if it didn't happen to coincide with you being their direct report. And knowing how to not let an imperfect boss erode your career momentum is an imperative skill for self-leadership. Okay, then let's talk about it because you, I would say a big chunk of the book was dedicated to this and I really appreciated it because I think that's you know, I resigned from a job once from a manager I loved. I loved him. And the first thing he said was, most people leave because of their manager. Is there anything I could have done different? And Wow. What a self-aware manager. He was the best. Yeah. I loved working for him and it wasn't about him, but it was an interesting thing to learn early on. And I've worked for a lot of different people. I know the listeners have all worked for people. We've all worked for different bosses across across our careers. So talk a little bit about, you identify four different boss types or leader type. Or excuse, I don't want to say the word leader, boss types. <laughs> so can we go through those four and just kind of like, I think people are going to be able to resonate when you go through the different uh, personas. Sure. So the first one is the no drama llama. This is the easiest boss to work for. So we're going to spend the least amount of time on it. This is a boss that's there when you need them, not there when you'd prefer to work independently. They set forth some strategic vision and then they're pretty hands off. You may need to ask them for support because they are that hands off boss. But generally, things go pretty smooth with this leader. The other three types are more challenging. The drill sergeant boss, which I think a lot of us in sales feel like we're working for. The whisper in the wind boss, the where is this person when I need them? I've never been able to track them down in a timely way. And the 
oddly obsessive boss. This one is so frustrating. They will not see that the strategic plan is a train wreck, but they will see that you made a typo on page four of that sales presentation. You're just like, why are you focused on this? So the reason I broke those out into categories is not to suggest that everyone falls neatly into a box, but to group some annoying behaviors and look at them and how the employee experiences them and what the employee can do to change the behavior of their boss. And that's where self-leadership starts to really take off because yes, your boss is demonstrating this annoying tendency, whatever it is, but you're in control of how you respond, how much you let it impact you, and to some degree, how you shape their behavior and lead up. So we can go through the strategies if you want to. Um, but I, I think the red thread through all of that and the, the ever-present theme of self-leadership is looking at, okay, this person, and in this case, my boss is doing this annoying thing. Maybe they're changing their mind every second of the day on what they're looking for. How am I going to respond and move from instead of that is so annoying, which it is, to how am I going to influence it? How am I going to change it? How am I going to protect myself through it in some cases? Well, I know I really appreciate the breakdown because I feel like something I've heard in the past from colleagues and coworkers is I shouldn't have to manage my boss. And you shouldn't, but yeah. you do. Exactly. <laughs> and that, that was always kind of a funny comment to say because it, it I, and you use the word leading up, which I thought was, you know, brilliant, but I, maybe from a, like, give us a couple tactics of if you're hearing this and you're resonating with like the whisper in the wind boss who's never there or the drill sergeant, give us a couple of tools for each and, and how we can really help lead up. So let's tackle the drill sergeant first. This boss is always blowing up their phone. They're in your Slack. They're in your inbox. They want to talk to you after every conversation you've had with a customer. You need to give this boss a place to land because you're not going to change their frantic energy. So if you have a drill sergeant boss, one of the best things you can do is set up a cadence with them outside of your one-on-one, -on -one, even if the cadence is daily, you have to give them a place to land and encouraging them to stack their questions to say, yeah, let's talk about it at our end of day huddle is going to over time train them to save it until they're talking to you. And again, even if it's more frequently than you'd like, you will not change their frantic energy. Maybe they've been let down by a team in the past. Maybe that's just who they are as a person, kind of frantic you have to give it a place to land. And from the seat you're in, the best way to do that is to create that standing cadence. That's wonderful. I've definitely had that type of boss. And um, I think giving them a place to land is such a easy thing to grasp. It's like, okay, I can do this. All right, what? let's talk about the whisper in the wind. The whisper in the wind boss is never responding to their emails. You have to follow up with them a million times to get a straight answer on everything. So the flip side of the drill sergeant and giving them a place to land is to, if you have a whisper in the wind boss, first stack up your questions. If something is not urgent, add it to a list. So you're tra tracking them down about a big list instead of a zillion isolated things. The second thing you can do is build up the urgency with them. Articulate what's at stake if they don't respond. Saying, if I don't get clarity on this, I'm not going to be able to get it to this customer. If we don't button this timeline up by the end of the week, we're not going to be able to move forward on, on schedule. Showing them and spelling out what is at stake is oftentimes enough to re-engage them as opposed to saying, just following up on this. You shouldn't have to do it, but you do sometimes. And that is leadership on behalf of your clients, behalf of your teammates who are winning on something. I also love the stacking of the questions. I definitely have also worked for a whisper in the wind and I had all these ideas all the time and I don't think he knew how to handle like all of Sarah's <laughs> ideas all the time. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to put them on a list so that I don't lose the brilliant idea I just had, but I'm not going to throw it at you off the fly. Like we'll have a, we'll have a cadence. And then the, um, the fourth one, yeah. So the fourth one, fourth one is a boss who's like always changing their mind. They're kind of all over the place. This boss needs a tee up. 
And what I mean by a tee up is before you engage with them, before you ask for feedback on something, you need to set that context because they're all over the place and they forgot. You need to say what we talked about last time was this. The plan we determined was X. We were going to have it done by Y. It matters because of Z. With that in mind, I wanted to show you what I have today. That few sentences is going to ground them in the conversation and bring them to where you need them to be. Because what's in their mind when they first show up is, our competitor's doing this, and I saw on TikTok we could do this, and maybe if we tried this other idea, it would be better. They're, they're swirling, and that can be really powerful powerful in a leader because a lot of times they're enthusiastic, they're energetic, but you need to bring them into the conversation with some table setting first. Okay. That's so easy to do too. I mean, what a small shift to deal with something that can be annoying. And and I also think what I liked about that was sometimes, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but I had a boss tell me once that you know, you make my life easier and then I don't have to worry about you. And I think about like setting the context for that boss who's, you know, impulsive or all over the place. That's just a way of making their life easier and then not getting irritated when, oh, I can't believe he doesn't remember this. can't believe she doesn't remember this. So I really appreciate those different tools. There's a lot more in the book. So if some of this is resonating, I'll make sure to link it in the show notes. I want to talk a little bit about how you ended the book around building friends at work. But before we pivot away from bosses and leadership, is there anything else I didn't ask that we want to make sure we we capture while we're talking? I want to put an umbrella over this conversation about boss management. And I think the phraseology you used for this is perfect. You shouldn't have to do it. And that is so much of leading yourself. You shouldn't have to try and, you know, make it work with these lethargic coworkers. You shouldn't have to fight uphill on some annoying systems. You shouldn't have to manage organizational overwhelm or an imperfect boss or confront these weird emerging technologies. But you do. And sitting and I shouldn't have to is only costing you. It's costing you your best thinking. It's costing you your energy. It's costing you your career trajectory. So when you move into, okay, shouldn't have to, but I do, you put yourself back in the power seat. And that mindset, like I do through the book, can be applied to almost any scenario. It's both really big and really small, and over time has the power to change how you feel about work and the opportunities you get at work. I mean, I think if I had this book 10 years ago, my career would have been on a totally different path, you know? And it's it's okay that now we have it, but I think that that's really where the mindset shift took me longer than I'd like to admit to get to. I think I still am positive, but I think that everyone's going to take something out of this because we all get in those ruts. We all get into the bummed out. We have to go to work to make money and survive, <laughs> you know, but it's part of it. So if you find yeah. joy and purpose in whatever you can control, I just think that's so powerful. Well, and um, let's go back 10 years ago. I was right there with you. I yeah. opened the book talking about how I absolutely hated my early career in advertising and eventually reached the conclusion that most of that was my fault. Yes, mm-hmm. I had an imperfect boss. Yes, I had imperfect clients. Yes, we were behind in our industry. And all of that was manageable if I just believed that it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, but it's it's kind of like when was the best time to plant a tree? Ten, yeah. Like, well, no, here we are. Like the best time for today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one resonates too. Um, well, and I loved, I mean, I think I think what has given my job purpose or my career purpose, just speaking from a personal angle, is friendships that I've made, friendships with coworkers, friendships with clients. Like I make friends easily. I'm lucky that way, but a lot of it is around work. So sometimes now in my business, sometimes I feel like I'm just spending my whole day having, building new friends. Elizabeth, you and I are going to be friends, but it just like, it's, it brings me so much joy. And I think that there's this weird, like gray cloud that you're not allowed to be friends with people you work with. And so you kind of wrap up the book with that angle. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that because it just brought me a lot of joy. 
That gray cloud is so awkward. And I think it's a holdover from when we worked nine to five in a very professional environment. And then we went home and our work life was completely separated from the rest of our lives. What we know is that's rarely the case. We talk about work-life balance, work-life integration, whatever you want to call it. We are who we are at work, at home, and all these different areas of our lives. And saying that you don't get to have friends at work is missing a huge opportunity. And the point I make in the book is, yes, it can be messy to have friends at work. Yes, you might have to fire one of your friends one day, and that would suck. But the cost of having no friends at work and spending 40 hours or more a week completely devoid of emotional connection is a much steeper price to pay than an awkward moment or two. So looking for opportunities to be friends with your colleagues, even if that doesn't mean like you're getting together every weekend, just small moments of human connection can really make a difference in a work experience that is otherwise quite isolating. I do think it comes naturally to most of your listeners and people in sales who are who are generally curious and open to other people but calling it out as i'm going to you know search for friendship at work is a powerful thing because that's exactly what you'll find when you look for it right and i think what's kind of nice about it in a work environment too is you have the opportunity to be friends with people you maybe normally wouldn't be friends with socially yeah. Like the age gap doesn't really matter at work because you're in the rowboat together. So you can be, you know, 25 year old friends with a 60 year old and it doesn't matter. Maybe you're not, you know, inviting them to your backyard barbecue, but that's okay. And I I just really appreciated that you put that kind of bow on it because I do think that that's something that brings a lot of value and it makes life better when you're in a work environment. Well, we talked about the second part of the subtitle, which is imperfect bosses, annoying coworkers, too many deliverables, all those other things. The first part before we get to the big list of grievances is how to find meaning, joy, and opportunities at work. And the odds of you creating that on an island by yourself are pretty low. Right. Joy, meaning, and opportunities takes other people too. Yes. Uh, Before we get into where people can find you, Anything else you want to leave our listeners with before we wrap up? Just know that the power is always in your hands. Even if it doesn't feel like it in the face of AI, even if it doesn't feel like it when your boss is, you know, breathing down your neck, you are always in the driver's seat and nobody is going to look out for you like you need to look out for yourself. Love it. Mic drop. Okay. And then where can people find you? On LinkedIn. You can search me at Elizabeth Lotardo. I have LinkedIn learning courses. I also go live on LinkedIn most weeks. You can follow me there. The book Leading Yourself is available everywhere books are sold. And when you buy a copy, you get the free video summary. So if reading a book is not your speed, I got you on a lunch break video. There you go. Okay. I'll link everything up in the show notes. I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks again for having me, Sarah. 